Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Katie Martin. I'm a member of the Mini-PCR Bio team, and I'm excited to be hosting today's webinar. This is the first in a mini-series of webinars that will introduce you to our brand new Bandit electrophoresis system. If you're a teacher who teaches electrophoresis as part of your curriculum, or if you want to introduce it, you're in the right place, and we're excited to show you this new tool we've developed, especially for folks like you. At Mini-PCR Bio, we make tools that go places that ordinary lab equipment can't go to enable biology research where it couldn't happen before. We have users in the field, we have sent equipment to space, and we also have lots of users in the classroom. We have a sizable curriculum team that develops resources teachers can use to show students how our tools can be used to, apply, uh, to be used and applied to solve problems in the real world. A big focus for us is gel electrophoresis. Electrophoresis is a cornerstone technique for DNA analysis in professional laboratories, and it's also common to see in biology curricula in high school and college. This is our blue gel electrophoresis system. It was built to be classroom friendly, and we have a whole portfolio of labs you can use to um, engage students in studying basic biological concepts that you're already covering in your curriculum. So things like inheritance, genetic identification, disease physiology, you can teach all of these concepts in a hands-on way using blue gel and the labs we've developed for it. But it is really, really easy for students to load and run a blue gel, read their results and move on without truly understanding electrophoresis. And that may be fine. You can use electrophoresis as a means to an end to cover other important material. But for those who want their students to understand electrophoresis at a deep level and really master it, we think there's a better way. So I'm going to be introducing you to our brand new Bandit electrophoresis system. This is the result of our effort to make a system that teaches students electrophoresis from the inside out. And with Bandit, understanding the science of electrophoresis is an inherent part of using the system. And that's because Bandit was designed with a build it to understand it approach. Bandit is not a no assembly required, ready to go electrophoresis system. It's a kit that students use to build their own electrophoresis system and then use it to run an experiment. We believe that by building the system themselves, students will necessarily engage with the scientific principles that underlie every electrophoresis run. Another benefit of the design of Bandit is that it supports an integrative approach to biotechnology. So in addition to using the system to cover the classic biological concepts like inheritance, gen genetic identification, disease physiology, you can also use it as a platform to discuss, uh, to discuss physical science principles. So things like charge and electric fields and properties of molecules. Bandit lets you decide how deep you wanna go with electrophoresis. You can simply use it as a means to an end. But if you want to go deep and help your students build an unshakable foundation in electrophoresis, you should use Bandit in conjunction with the curriculum I'll be sharing today, our Bandit building activity from circuits to molecules, which is a pedagogical approach to building the system. You can find this activity um, online as a free download. So if you go to the Bandit page on the Mini PCR store and click the Downloads tab, you'll see the Teacher's Guide and Student's Guide for this activity available as, as PDF downloads. Now, before we dive into this activity, let's talk a little bit more generally about what electrophoresis is and what kinds of questions you can answer with it. Electrophoresis has many applications, and a few of the ones that are more common include diagnosing disease, identifying individuals, or telling whether individuals are related. And by related, we might be looking to see if individuals are from the same family or from the same species. We can walk through an example inspired by our Discovering Lemur Diversity Learning Lab. In that lab, we use electrophoresis to determine whether lemurs living in the wild in Madagascar belong to different species. By looking at lemur DNA, we get a conclusive answer to this question. We can take advantage of the fact that gene sequences are different for different species. The site B, uh, site B is the name of a gene commonly used for species identification. We can use a tool called a restriction enzyme that acts like a pair of molecular scissors. In this lab, our restriction enzyme will only cut the site B sequence that's specific to the lemur species C. crosslei. It will not be able to cut the site B sequence if it comes from any other lemur species. So if we're asking if this other lemur belongs to the same species, we can look to see if its site B gene can be cut by our restriction enzyme. If the gene is cut, we know this lemur is also from C. crosslei. 
If it's not cut, we know it's from a different species. We can then use electrophoresis to separate DNA fragments based on their size. So in this example, we'll do that to distinguish C. crossley DNA from DNA belonging to other lemur species. If we break the word electrophoresis down, it'll tell us how we're going to be doing that. Electro comes from electricity, and phoresis comes from ancient Greek and means being carried. So we're going to use electricity to carry DNA through our gel and separate it by size. Now, a DNA electrophoresis experiment starts with an agarose gel. And I'm holding an agarose gel here. My gel is a brick of agarose, which is a polysaccharide extracted from seaweed, and it has a texture like firm jello. My gel has a row of rectangular pockets along the top. We'll call those wells. And during an experiment, we put DNA samples from each lemur into those wells. Electrophoresis takes advantage of the fact that DNA is negatively charged. And so if we put electrodes at the top and at the bottom of our gel to create an electric field, DNA will travel through our gel toward the positive electrode. But it's not necessarily going to be an easy trip. At a microscopic level, our gel has um, a web-like texture that the DNA fragments have to wiggle through. So what you're seeing there is actually an electron microscope image of the inside of an, an, an agarose gel. So you can see that, that mesh-like texture that DNA has to navigate through. Now on this slide, I've turned our gel on its side. So the negative electrode is now on the left and the positive one's on the right. And we are zoomed way in. Oops. We are zoomed way in so we can see the web-like structure that makes up our gel. On the left here are two DNA fragments, one large and one small. And when we turn on our electric field, both DNA fragments will be attracted to the positive electrode, but the smaller one will be able to zip through the web inside the gel where the big one is gonna get hung up and move a lot slower. So in the same amount of time, a small fragment will move much further through our gel than the large one. So in electrophoresis, this is how we're able to separate DNA fragments by their size. Now when we zoom back out, this is what we'll see during the course of our electrophoresis experiment. The DNA sample we load into our gel might contain DNA fragments of many sizes, and those samples will get separated into bands, each containing a group of DNA molecules of the same size. The bands that are furthest away from the well contain the smallest fragments, and the bands that are closer to the well contain the largest ones. So let's carry this all back to our experiment. Now remember, we're running DNA from our two lemurs in this gel. The one on the left we know is from the species C. crosslii, and the one on the right is our mystery lemur. Let's first look at the sample from our first lemur. We know, again, this one belongs to the species C. crosslii, and we see two bands in this sample, which means the sample was composed of two differently sized segments of DNA. This is consistent with what we expected to see for C. crosslii, because we know our restriction enzyme cuts the C. crosslii gene for site B, generating two differently sized fragments of that gene, a large segment, which is going to correspond to the top band, and a small segment, which will correspond to the bottom band. Now let's look at our mystery lemur. So in this lemur's DNA sample, we see just one band, meaning the DNA fragments in the sample are all of the same size, and that size is larger than either of the fragments we saw in the first lemur sample. This means that the restriction enzyme we used did not cut this lemur site B gene, so we just have one big uncut site B fragment here. Remember that enzyme only cuts the site B sequence in lemurs from the species C crosslii. Because it didn't cut, we, assume our, we can assume our mystery lemur is not from C. crosslii, and so these lemurs are not from the same species. Now, this is just one illustrative example of a problem you can solve with electrophoresis, and of course you can use it for lots of other purposes as well. What changes is the specific genes or DNA sequences you're focusing on, but the underlying science of DNA fragment separation remains the same. So, now that we're up to speed on how electrophoresis works, let's dive into our activity. In From Circuits to Molecules, students are going to build their electrophoresis rig from scratch and then use it to run an experiment. And we do that through a three-part challenge that breaks the system down in, into its component parts. The first challenge will focus in on that electrical circuit that we're going to use to push DNA fragments through the gel. So let's take a look at the parts we're going to build our circuit with. Uh, 
Okay, so this uh, spool of wire is what we're going to make our electrodes out of. We can cut off a length of that electrode, and then we're going to thread them through these silicone bumpers called electro dams. That's what's going to kind of hold them taut at the bottom and top of our gel. And so I can thread this electrode wire through my electro dam just like this. There's a little channel there that the wire sits in. Um, and that's what's going to kind of support the wire during our run. Now these electro dams, they will pull double duty. Right now we've just configured this one to be an electrode, but later on we're going to uh, use them as dams when it's time to cast our gel. And we'll need to connect these electrodes to electricity using these alligator clips. These alligator clips are connected to leads. Um, and so we're going to just when it's time to, to power our system, we're going to clip the elect, uh, alligator clips right onto the electrode wire. Now at the other end um, of these alligator clips, we plug this cable right into the wall. Um, so here is our um, the power source that we use. And in between these sits our, our circuit controller. That houses some safety mechanisms that limit the current coming out of the system, so I'm able to touch those clips safely. Now, ultimately, we'll be completing this circuit by putting a gel and some buffer between those electrodes. But before we do that, we need to figure out the direction through which the current will flow between these leads. Is it going to flow from um, the black electrode into the red one or from the red electrode into the black? This is going to be important to figure out because later on, we'll use that knowledge to make sure DNA is flowing through our gel in the direction we need it to. So we give you a little testing device you can use to figure out the direction of current flow. This is a little circuit board with LEDs that will only illuminate when electricity is flowing from the negative contact on the left there to the positive contact on the right. Let's take a look at how that works. So this is um, the LED strip that we'll be testing with and it has these little metal plates at either end and I can just clip my alligator clips onto these metal plates. And there we go, we've lit, we've lit up the, the test strip. Now notice though, if I switch the order and I put the red clip at the negative electrode, or if I put the, the red electrode at the negative end of the circuit board and the black one at the positive end, the arrow does not illuminate. So that tells us something about the polarity of our, um, our alligator clips. And so let's talk about what that means. So when we connect the electrodes in the correct way and our arrow lights up, that tells us that electrons are moving from the negative electrode to the positive electrode. And the flow of electrons is electricity. I mean, that when we're talking about electricity, we're talking about the flow of electrons or the flow of negative charge. Now, how does this apply to our electrophoresis system? Well, this is also telling us the direction DNA will move through our gel. So it'll reinforce the concept that DNA is negatively charged. And we're going to return to this a little bit later on when it's time to run our gel. So that's challenge one in a nutshell. At the end of challenge one, what students walk away with is a familiarity with the key forces that power a gel run. They understand the electrical circuit that really underlies the system. In challenge two, students will be making the gel. So we're gonna kind of drop the circuit for now and focus in on the gel part of our electrophoresis system. Now, making gels can be, when I, I was a teacher before I worked here at Mini PCR, and making gels to me was just kind of a chore I did before class. Um, but with challenge two, what you can do is take that chore and turn it into a learning experience for your students. Now, if you would still prefer to, to pour the gels yourself, if it'll save you time to do it that way, this guide is written in kind of a modular way so that you can skip challenge two and just take your students through challenges one and three. Um, there's, there won't be any gaps or kind of missing steps there for them. Um, but if you do want your students to take this step um, and use it as a learning opportunity, they'll approach it as a critical thinking exercise. So we frame this challenge to students like, you know, how are we going to create this final product? We have this brick of agarose with these wells in it. How do we get from point A to point B to this, this final gel? We make gels by casting them. So we make a mold and then we pour in melted agarose. And when it hardens, we have our gel. It's really just like making jello, right? We melt it down, pour it into our mold, and then we have you know, our, our jello centerpiece for our party tonight. So let's take a look uh, at how pouring gels works with Bandit. Okay, so here are the parts we're gonna build our system with. This is the buffer chamber where we'll both cast and run our gel. 
And we're going to use now our electro dams that we had previously threaded with electrodes. We're going to use them as dams now. So if we seat those dams right at either end of the gel, they're just going to block off and save us some space. Later on, that's the space where the electrodes will sit when it's ready to run our gel. Now to make our wells, we're going to use this comb. Um, each tooth of this comb is going to make one well, and the bandit comb has a side that can make nine or a side that can make six wells. We're going to use the six well side today. We want our comb to kind of sit um, up and make pockets, and so these comb supports kind of go on either side of our buffer chamber, and they'll just suspend our comb in the mold. Um, if we don't have these comb supports here, the, the comb teeth will hit the bottom of the buffer chamber and that'll lead us to create holes in our gel rather than the pockets that we want. And so there we go, That's can uh, uh, that is our bandit system in casting mode. And so the only thing left to do now is pour in the melted agarose that we're going to use to make our gel. So here's my agarose. I'm pouring in uh, 30 milliliters is the amount of agarose that a bandit um, gel takes. So there it is. And it'll take about 10 minutes for it to firm up and harden. And so we'll come to, back to it in a second. Okay, so that's challenge two. It's taking a prep step for you and turning it into a teaching moment for students. Um, and so at the end of challenge two, what students walk away with is a valuable technical skill, right? Knowing how to pour gel is like knowing how to micro pipe. It's a really valuable skill that you'll use in almost any molecular biology laboratory. So by having this skill in their toolkit, um, students will be ready, you know, for the next internship opportunity that comes up down the road if they can show the researchers there that they can do these valuable technical steps. And the guide for um, our From Circuits to Molecules activity is written to be conducive to, um, or it's written to make this uh, more pedagogical. So rather than just a list of steps that students have to walk through, the curriculum supports kind of a critical thinking approach. So the procedures interspersed with stop and think assessments that give students a chance to apply their understanding and give you a chance to formatively assess your students. Okay, so we've laid the foundation for understanding electrophoresis. Now in this challenge, we're gonna tie it all together and integrate the gel we just made into our circuit and start running our samples. So we're gonna switch our system from casting mode into run mode. Now, cooking show style, I have a ready to go gel here. And so let's take that out and then I'll show you what it looks like when we flip Bandit um, into run mode and turn the system on. Okay, so here's our gel, ready to run. It's hardened at this point. So I'm gonna pull the comb out and pull the comb supports off the sides. And you can see the wells that the comb left behind. They look just like we want them to, nice little rectangular pockets. And I'm gonna take my electro dams now and flip them from dam mode back into electrode mode. So if I flip them upside down, that'll place the electrode wire right at the bottom of the chamber and it'll leave this kind of end of the electrode free for me to clip onto. And we'll do the same with, um, with our red electrode here, or our red electrode dam. And I'll grab my alligator clips now, which are what's gonna carry electricity into my system. We'll clip that black one on, and then I'm just gonna wrap the free end of the wire around a little bit to make sure I have good contact there. And then I'll do the same with the red one. Clip that on and then we'll wrap the free end around that alligator clip just to make sure we have good consistent contact. Now we have to complete this circuit and so I'm going to pour buffer over the gel and the electrodes and that buffer is just going to conduct electricity throughout our gel. And there we go, that completes our electrophoresis circuit. Now I'm not plugging it into the wall just yet. I want to load it before I do so. Okay, so this is what our final electrophoresis system looks like once it's fully built. And once we power it on, we are going to complete the circuit and we're going to be transmitting electricity now through our gel. Um, and so we've confirmed uh, we're going to carry that knowledge that we built in challenge one, where we figured out which electrode is the negative electrode, which one is the positive electrode. We know that the negative electrode is black. We're going to place that at the top of our gel. We want the positive one at the bottom, so the negatively charged DNA is going to be drawn down toward it. 
And so the question to pose to students is, okay, our circuit's complete, what happens to charged molecules that we put in the electric field? We know the, uh, that electricity is the movement of electrons, right, of, of negatively charged electrons through a circuit, um, but that's going to apply to other molecules too. So any charged molecule that you put in this field is now going to behave according to the way that that field is set up. If we have a negatively charged molecule, it's going to travel toward the positive electrode. If you put in a positively charged molecule, it'll move up toward the negative electrode. And so let's take a look and see this happening in real time. So I'm about to load my gel. Um, I'm going to put my samples in the wells of our gel, and then once we turn on the system, we'll see how they migrate through. So I'm going to load our gel using a micropipette that's going to pick up 10 microliters of my samples and load them into the wells. So this is a 10 microliter fixed volume micropipette that, that we sell at MiniPCR. And it's really nice for classroom use. There's no, uh, you don't have to set the volume. So it always picks up 10 microliters. It's just kind of one less thing to worry about when your students are first learning how to micropipette. So you can see my samples are dyed blue. And in fact, they're blue dye samples. I'm not actually loading DNA. Um, but but a blue dye sample instead. So as we've discussed, electrophoresis works with any charged molecules. And so in biology, we often talk about using electrophoresis to separate DNA, but you can use it to separate other types of charged molecules as well. So this is actually one of the new dye electrophoresis labs that uh, we've released, especially for the Bandit system. I'm going to talk more about those in a few slides. Um, but at this point, I do want to emphasize Bandit doesn't come with samples to load. Bandit itself is a hardware kit, so in order to use it the way I'm using um, in this webinar today, you'll need to purchase a lab kit, which will contain the samples that you'll load, and then you also will need to purchase um, the ingredients to make gels and buffer to run those samples in. These things can all be found in the mini PCR store, and I'll share some ideas for which kits to get started with in, in a few slides. Okay, and I'm just finishing up with my last sample here loading it in the sixth well, and you can see those nice blue rectangles are telling me I've loaded it as I intended to. Um, I didn't, you know, inadvertently inject the sample into the side or the bottom of the gel. So looks good. It looks like we're ready to run. All right, we will check back in on this gel in a few minutes, but because you don't get to watch it running, here's a time-lapsed image showing what it looks like as the samples run out over 20 minutes. So as you can see, the results are visible immediately and there's no need for a separate staining step or additional visualization equipment. What you load into Bandit is up to you. You can run DNA in a Bandit gel, but visualizing DNA with the system will require additional protocols to stain the DNA and additional equipment to view your samples with. So we've developed a set of dye electrophoresis labs where you run dye samples that simulate DNA samples. You can use them the same way you would use a DNA electrophoresis lab, um, but what you're running are actually just dye samples and not DNA itself. They're classroom safe, um, but they don't contain any DNA. And the reason that we've, we're offering these, these labs is because they don't require any additional staining steps or any visualization equipment. You can see the results as you're running your gel right on your bench top in about 15 minutes. Another nice thing about our dielectrophoresis labs is we're going to be shipping them pre-aliquoted. So rather than sending you one big tube of each sample that you then have to break down and micropipette into separate tubes for each student group, we're just going to send you strips of tubes and you just hand each strip to each student group and they can just go ahead and, and load those immediately. So it'll save you a lot of prep time. And because these dye labs simulate DNA samples, you can use them to cover a range of biology concepts. And I'll give you a little preview of what our portfolio is going to include on the next slide. <clears throat> so we have one dye electrophoresis lab that's currently available and a bunch of others in the pipeline that will follow it. The one that's currently available is our molecular rainbow lab. Um, which is an exploration of molecular properties, a great companion to the Bandit system. In this lab, students will explore how different properties of their samples, the number of different molecules they contain, the size of those molecules, and the charge of those molecules will influence what they can observe during a gel run. 
We also have a free version of our Molecular Rainbow Lab that doesn't require you to purchase anything. It teaches you how to make the dye samples just from household ingredients, and then um, it leads you through the process of um, making the samples that you can load up into your Bandit system. I've linked the PDF below in the description for this video that you can use to run um, that free version of our Rainbow Lab. <clears throat> Now coming up, we have um, a bunch of other dielectrophoresis labs in the pipeline, and I'll give you a little preview of each one here. Um, we have Microbe Hunters, which is based on real-world research taking place on the International Space Station. This lab uses electrophoresis to identify bacterial pathogens that have contaminated different surfaces aboard the ISS. We have an upcoming cat genetics lab um, where students genotype a litter of kittens for a gene that's thought to be associated with white spotting and then determine which allele leads to white spotting versus a uniform coat. And then we have Mendel's peas, which is a lab where students explore the relationship between genotype and phenotype using a classic system that you're probably already talking about with them, uh, the early genetics exper experiments uh, that Mendel conducted on his pea plants. Now, if you want to learn more about those labs, come back for the remaining webinars in our series. Next week, we're going to be taking you through the Molecular Rainbow Lab, and then in two weeks, we'll share a sneak peek at the Cat Genetics Lab. Now, if you're really interested in Bandit and actually want to get a chance to use it hands-on for yourself, you can sign up for a Bandit virtual workshop. We partner with Genes in Space, which is our free experimental design competition that we run in partnership with Boeing to put on a virtual professional development session um, <clears throat> that familiarizes you with new biotechnology and space biology research. Now, this upcoming school year, we're gonna be um, integrating Bandit into those workshops. For $25, uh, for a $25 registration fee, you will receive a Bandit kit that you can keep, and then you'll also take part in a two hour virtual training session with teachers all around the country and where we'll walk through a Bandit experiment and teach you how to use the tools hands-on. Now for fall 2022, we're holding Bandit virtual workshops on Saturday, October 1st, and on Thursday, November 17th. And if you'd like to sign up, you can email outreach at minipcr.com um, to sign up now. Okay, we've run our gel for a few minutes now. Um, we won't see our full results just yet. We'll, we'll be able to see um, some uh, movement in our gel. So let's take a look at what it looks like. Okay, so our gel has just been running for a few minutes, but we can already see our bands and some separation here. You know, I'm actually going to put a sheet of white paper underneath this so you can see our bands even better. So we've been running for a few minutes, but we can already see some of our samples. It looks like um, we're just seeing one band that's run out. Some we're seeing two bands, so we're able to resolve and get some separation. Uh, for those samples that contain multiple molecules already. So there you go. So, so that wraps up our From Circuits to Molecules Bandit assembly activity. It is a way to walk your students through the process of assembling and running Bandit that's pedagogical and requires them to think critically and actively about the science underlying this technique. Again, you can download this activity for free if you go to the Bandit page in the Mini PCR store. I've linked that page in the description below. If you go to the Downloads tab, you'll find the Teacher's Guide and Student's Guides for this activity. And this is an activity that you can use, you can add on anytime you use the Bandit system. It really works with any Bandit lab you're running. You can also not use it at all. We have very straightforward building instructions separately from this activity. So it's really a choose your own adventure in terms of how deep you want to go with electrophoresis. So just to close, I want to kind of um, kind of talk big picture about how we approach Bandit. I mean, we really believe that this build it to understand it approach is going to be conducive to building a really solid foundation in electrophoresis for your students. Our belief is that when students learn electrophoresis with Bandit, they will always understand it. It's kind of like the difference between making coffee with a traditional coffee maker or with a French press versus making it with pods. Like one way is conducive to understanding the process and the, you know, the science behind making coffee and the other isn't. It's more of a black box. Um, the Bandit is our transparent electrophoresis system that really forces students to engage with the principles underlying electrophoresis every single time they use the system. 
So to close, Bandit is an integrative kit that bridges science and engineering practices, as we've talked about earlier. But I also want to emphasize that it's a fully functional electrophoresis system and an affordable option for classroom electrophoresis. Introductory pricing is $75 per unit, um, so it's a simple and affordable way to bring electrophoresis into your classroom. It is not like a single-use kit. You can use it over and over again. Even the electrodes, that fine wire, can be reused time and time again. Um, and it runs on electrical power, not on batteries. So there's no consumables other than your, you know, your gel making supplies. There's no consumables that need to be, you know, bought time and time again to replenish the system. So I hope to see you back here over the next couple of weeks as we continue to talk about Bandit and the remaining webinars in our series. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the Bandit system and I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Till then.